Hello, everyone, and welcome to another presentation for the Games MOOC. Tonight's presentation is DIY. Sorry, prompter. DIY mystery with Vasily Giannoutsis. So, we'll go ahead and have Vasily get started. Most of you know him as Blue Barker Low Tide from Second Life, and uh, he's a graphics instructional designer in Virginia. And I will let him take us down the path of mystery. Go ahead. Hi guys, my name is Vasily Genesis, and we're going to be talking about mystery. Mystery is probably the most exciting thing in the world because it's everywhere. And I don't mean to scare anybody, but I mean mysteries is what makes the world go round. So, let's get started. Come on, okay. So, let's get over with a quick overview of narrative. I know Sherry Jones went over it last week, but I mean a quick refresher. Um, we have setting, we have character, we have conflict, plot, action, meaning the rise and fall of the action, the climax, the peak at which action is at its highest, resolution, and conclusion. So, getting into things. So, we have the big five cues of mystery. The five questions of mystery. These are the driving force of mystery and suspense. Vasily, uh, yes. we, if you're trying to, if you have a slideshow you want to show, we're not seeing that. So you want to do a huh. uh, share screen with it. I did do share screen. Sad face. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh boy. How about now, guys? Now you can see it. Yep. So sorry. So really quickly, super fast this time, setting character conflict, plot, action, climax, resolution, conclusion. Awesome. So the big five cues of mystery, these are the driving forces of mystery and suspense. Without having these questions, you don't have a mystery and you don't have a story. So the big five W's, we'll say, are who, what, where, when, and why. I'm going to sound a lot like a, an intrepid reporter, but... This is what it means to be a mystery. You need to know your five W's before you can really continue. Before you can even write your mystery, you need to know these. So, let's take a fun trip through time and look at some of the greatest mystery makers to gain some perspective, to see what they did so that we can learn from it and we can progress in the present. But I'll abbreviate it a lot because there are a lot of people who affected mystery over, over time for both literature, television, and film. So, our starting guy is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, 1800s. Everyone probably has known him for the creator of Sherlock Holmes. He has had over 56 stories, which is very impressive for that time because, you know, the short lifespans. But let's talk about Charles Dickens. He had 50 stories. 56, I mean, they balanced each other out, but the more important thing is that Sherlock Holmes was the hallmark of what crime fiction was, and it made it so popular with that day and age. So, moving on, we have W.R. Bonnet. He was early 1930s. Now, he was very much into the noir film, and he was, people might not know him, but I mean, he was the screenwriter for the High Sierra, Little Caesar, Scarface. Everyone loves Scarface, but who knows who wrote it? W.R. Bonnet did. He really brought to life such gritty action stories with our detectives, with our thugs trying to rebel themselves. And I mean, that was one of W.R. Bonnet's themes. Most of them were redemptions. Most of his stories consisted of characters who fell into a bad place or were, or were hard on their luck. And so they turned to crime to try and get up and get out. But they just kept getting deeper and deeper. And by the end, they were just trying to redeem themselves, trying to gain forgiveness. And with W.R. Bonnet, we get the first couple appearances of our femme fatales, our busty female distractions from our goals. Our next up is Alfred Hitchcock, post-1930s to 1960s. He is our master of suspense. Now, suspense is not mystery, but there are both very similar elements of both suspense and mystery that 
intertwined together that work so well together, as you'll see within Birds, North by Northwest, Real Window, and Psycho. He is the creator of terms such as the twist endings, the when you keep going and then something miraculously happens that like they were talking about it but you didn't really know and then all the pieces come together like oh wow and then MacGuffin. MacGuffin is when you when you are forced to focus on something for such a long amount of time you think it's very important but then by the end it's not important and that's because it's usually overshadowed by the grand scheme and you're totally blown away by the grand design and then crime psychological that might not sound like a good term but crime psychological really explains why should we care about the villains and their intentions like this is explaining the psychological illnesses and around that time period we were just starting to discover what mental illness was so the crime psychological was trying to help explain why villains did the things they did most commonly in psycho why Mr. Bates wore his dead grandmother's outfit, so to speak. So I'm going to shift focus now because we're going to move from serious to funny because mystery is not just guns and drugs and, and games. It's funny as well. William Hanna and Joseph Barbera, or Hanna and Barbera from the 1960s to the, about the 1990s, they developed over 100 different animation cartoons, very particular individual things that were different concepts that were fairly developed, but half of them were mystery-themed. How does that happen? Well, our famous one is Scooby-Doo. So you have a group of kids, a group of animals, teens, children, all trying to solve mysteries. And so this was this was revolutionary because mystery was not about wasn't wasn't serious anymore. Or at least it wasn't as serious. It wasn't about the guns or the corruption or the blackmailing. It was about the pure essence of what a mystery was. Solving crimes, solving cases, trying to the who, what, where and when. And they also sprinkled in supernatural elements, gatewaying into the heroic characters, and also spy elements. I hate to break it to you guys, but Secret Squirrel was there before James Bond. So, uh, I have a typo on this one real quick, but it's Bob Kane in the 1930s to Paul Denny in the 1980s. Bob Kane was the man who created and writ Batman for his first detective comments. And the thing that made this very special was because it was mystery and hero being unified together in a very different way. Sure, we've had private eyes like Dick Tracy run around solving crimes, but granted, no one's a multi-billionaire, but he wasn't, he didn't have superpowers. He was just trying to do good. He was trying to do right because he was wronged when he was young. But I mean, he had that intentions. He was Batman. You can't touch Batman. So with Paul Dini coming in the 1980s, he really bringing in the animated version to the masses, you saw that Batman wasn't just. He wasn't a private eye. He wasn't a superhero. He was the underdog that was taking on all this gritty realism of gangs, drugs, blackmail, of, of the psychological crime that we will talk the criminal psychological bleh, criminal psychology that was brought in by Hitchcock so the different kinds of mysteries that we have yes there are different kinds of mysteries I know that might sound like a mysterious thing but bear with me we have our traditional mysteries when we first started out with mysteries we had things called the locked room mystery when you're reading about someone who was stuck in a room and they had to figure out how to do it and they described what what was in the room, and there are some games like that too. Um, Silent Hill 4 is like that, where they had you were trapped in a room for the first intro level, and your puzzle mysteries like Professor Layton, when you solve walkie puzzles to get through the mystery, you have your legal thrillers, which was 
White Collar, Your Law and Order, Medical Thrillers, House, Grey's Anatomy, ER, Cozy Mystery, it's your fun little who's done it with Agatha Christie or Mary Kay Andrews, where they where they focus mostly on character development because you like the characters and you want to see them to succeed. Your police procedural where you're dealing with people that are involved in the law, and it's very specific that that, that is what that is, because it's not it's separate from what the hard boiled private eye is, because the hard boiled private eye isn't the detective, it's someone who walks outside the law, who doesn't, who isn't bound by the law, and you're focusing on the fact that he's doing the right thing without breaking the law. Or, well, let's just say he breaks in and he can break the law sometimes, but we'll get down to that later. So, the big question now is how? How do we go about writing mysteries? Well, because you already know your purpose. And I mean, it's we're trying to teach kids. We're trying to teach people what we do, how we do it, but how do we, how do we make that exciting? So where does that leave you? We have to figure out that in between. We want to, we already know our ending. We want them to know this and this and this answer. We want them to be excited or to learn the material and remember it. Well, you'll be getting a middle. I mean, that's where it all starts. That's the meat and the potatoes so to speak. So let's pretend that we're game designers. So let's talk about what one of the first question, everyday questions that game designers ask themselves. How do we engage our players? Practically the same question we teachers have. How do we engage our students? And it's, it's this kind of versatility that, I mean, teachers can be game designers. There's no if they and so buts, I mean, we have that potential. But if you're a game designer, you'll have a producer who tells you what to do. So they'll tell you to either make sequels or introduce, introduce something new to, to the mix, whether it's a new race, a new class, new weapons, new skins, costumes, etc. So why should we care? Why do we care about mystery? Why, why is it going to work for me? Well, history, well, mystery is is more important than than we think. It's for teachers, it's harder to understand, and for writers, it's much harder. But it's how are we breaking the mold to separate ourselves from everyone else? So many questions that need answers, but not enough hours in the day. Yet we still get things done, but. We care because mystery is one of the top three best-selling genres out there. Without mystery, there wouldn't be romance. Oh, who's that tall, dark, and strange person? Oh, oh, maybe they're... Oh, just these questions that spring up because they bring us intrigue. They want us to get into the story. It's always that asking, like, who, what, where... Those constant things need to be in your mind, buzzing around. I mean, sure, they, they give you those answers, but I mean, even then, you should question the answers, and it's important to do that. So, because a friend on the site was like, oh, I love Supernatural. Well, here's your chance. So, here's my example with Supernatural. With Supernatural, within the first three minutes, they establish a lot for you, actually. So, within the first three minutes, we understand... Briefly, who all who all the main who the main boys are, and what they do. But more specifically, what is going on? It it tells us what has happened, but we have to figure out the who who did that. We have to figure out the why they did that. But they give us the when and the where. October twenty eighth, two thousand nine, and it's nighttime too. And where the eagle's nest. It's. It's these kind of things that establish the mystery, but it's more that we care about is the how. How are they going to find the why? How are they going to find who did it? Whether they found a ghost, whether it's a demon, or whether they found a dead body. It's those kind of questions that, sure, they're the good guys and they're going to win, but it's that how that keeps us drawing back in. 
So going back in with pop culture, we have Doctor Who. Doctor Who is fairly is about the same caliber with with probably above Supernatural, but so with Supernatural, you have they're in a different location every time because they're traveling in their call. With Doctor Who, it's a new place, a new dimension, a new planet, a new world. But they don't they explain it within the first seven minutes gently into the conversation. But it's not like they're shoving it in your face. They're not throwing you information just because they have to. They show it to you. You see a giant total with a planet on its back. You'll transported into a library with thousands of books being guarded by crying angel statues. Like, you wo- you're not worried about those kinds of questions until you really get into what's happening. Because Doctor Who, when he first comes on the scene, he's like, what's happening? I'm supposed to fix something. Is there something wrong? What time is it? What day is it? Is there a special event happening? Like, he's there on the ball trying to figure out what's going on because he has a job to do. And we know that, and we know that he's trying to fix and solve things. And, I mean, that's what a problem solver does. That's what your audience will do. That's what your students would, students are going to do. They're going to ask these questions. And as good mystery writers, we find ourselves having to be both the good guy and the bad guy. You have to be in both places at the same time and then being able to separate yourself so you're not giving things away too easily or too quickly. So, how does this translate into games? Games have a very special connection because it's not something that, sure, you can read. There are sections where you read in games. Sure, there are sections where you're listening to things. But with games, you have a real participation that is what makes games games. That putting them in there, the thing that separates games from books and films is that with games, you are immersed into it. You're transported into it. You are that character. You're a player in this case. You're not just watching the film. You're not just reading the book and being the audience, unless it's one of those choose-your-own-adventure books. But still, with games, you have that interactivity that you just can't get from film or, or books. So it is meant to help you. How does mystery affect games? Mystery is a tool that will help you. It asks you, what are you solving? What is that purpose? How do we come to that conclusion? It's these types of questions that will get you further along and that will really separate your stuff from the the little cookie-cutter whodunits into the more evolved, wow, I have to think to actually do this critical thinking to solve this problem, to figure out who is doing this or what is happening and why is it happening. We're all given in our daily lives, we watch the news. Everything is fed to us. I mean, and we very rarely question that. I mean, they have on the bottom, they have who is doing what, when, and where. Why should we care about anything else if it's all there for us? Well, granted, the why isn't there, but we just move on to the next news story, but we need to be more aggressive when we are uh, aggressive, or I should say proactive when it comes to solving these mysteries, these crimes. So, okay, guys, here's our chance to interact with you guys, with you all. So everybody that's in the Google Hangout, we have two examples for you. We have the World of Warcraft example, and we have the Fables example. So if you guys want to vote up or tell me what um, which one you want, we can get started on that. Okay, um, I'd say go ahead and look at your chat over on the right-hand side because people are voting. Oh boy. So go ahead and click on chat on the left-hand side and then it appears on the right-hand side. Oh, I had a feeling, wow, okay. <laughs> why, why would that be? <laughs> you wouldn't have to belong to a World of Warcraft guild, would you? <laughs> oh, you know. <laughs> Alrighty. That leads us into a wonderful WoW example. So, we'll get right on to that. And, I mean, periodically there will be questions being asked. So, I'll, I'll let you know when you guys are up again. <laughs> sure. But thanks, you guys, for choosing. Can you guys see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So, 
You choose. You guys chose World of Warcraft, but there was a catch. This is before the mists of Pandaria. So, let's imagine that we're going to roleplay. Let's just say that we are game designers. More specifically, we're game designers. Working on the new WoW expansion, Mists of Pandaria. Now, I imagine that most of you guys have already played Panda, the Panda expansion and you guys have breezed through the introduction level. But let us take some time to analyze it and dissect it so that we can understand because it's a big mystery of how we're going to do this. So, and these are all going to be like the questions you guys are going to run into and how are you guys are going to triumph in, in with your own examples and with your own mysteries that you're going to make. So imagine yourselves, you guys are all in a boardroom, you have whiteboards everywhere, you have a table with lots of papers on it, you have lots of concept art, and you're being locked in by Blizzard. And they won't let you out until you have at least the beginnings or the synopsis, synopsis of the opening level. Oh boy. It's going to be a long day. Twelve angry men. So, let's start by asking ourselves the basics. Who, what, where, when, and why. So, to continue, we must know about our main character. So, who are the Pandarans? What do they do? Where do they come from? When do they make contact with the WoW universe? And why are they here? These are our questions. We have to find answers for them. Because, quite frankly, the Pandarans, they're just a small piece of the gigantic book that is World of Warcraft folklore. I kid you not. So, quick story on the Pandarans. They were an April Fool's joke by Blizzard within for the World of Warcraft for three with our brewmaster who was a drunk old panda, but that's besides the point. But people loved him. People loved to use him. They loved to see him. And Blizzard did not expect for anybody to react this way to liking the Pandarans and wanting to have it in the game. And they received so much email, fan mail, requests that they're like, okay, we, we have to do this. There's no reason why we shouldn't. So this brings us to our questions on how are we going to do all this. So now this, even though we have the who, what, where, when, and why, when we're dealing with games, we, especially games that have been in progress for this long, I mean, we're dealing with preconceived things that have already been established. We can't really mess with those or change those. Like how there are two sides to this war. Alliance versus Horde. They both hate each other based on something that happened way, way, way back in Warcraft that I don't have time to talk about. So we have to, when we're doing this, while we're making our opening level for the Mists of Pandera, what is the most believable way we can integrate the Pandaren into the folklore and the world of Warcraft seamlessly without having a lot of people rage us or upsetting the balance of this living and breathing world of Azeroth. Because it is alive. It is breathing. They all have things that they do, whether it's just programmed in their code, but they all have lives. I mean, the NPCs don't always stand there, except probably for the innkeepers. But, I mean, they all have scout patterns that they walk around in. They, um, let's see, I was... I was waiting for an airship to come the other night in Ogamore, and at precisely so and so time, the 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 flight crew was practicing their um their training for battle, and I was like, "That's heal? Wait, what are they doing? Why would they do that?" But it's like it grows on you. It tells you that Warcraft is a place. Azeroth is a place, and these people are at war. But we're trying to help and aid them. We're trying to do our best to do our part for our respected countries and alliances. So how are we going to do this? Integrate pandas into WoW because you don't normally see walking pandas in WoW. What a very strange thought. Does anybody have any suggestions on how we would do this?
Let's look at the questions. Oh. Did you lost audio with me, Jim? Um, I'm hearing your I'm hearing your audio okay. <laughs> so so it looks like um Jim's gonna re log. Okay. Um, that's fine. So your so your question was, how, you're asking people how do you introduce the Pandarians? Yes. Or, or how do you introduce a panda into a fierce um, world of war? <laughs> world of war. Yes, exactly. Any suggestions from the people in Hangout? The problem with the people in Hangout is that. We play WoW, so we know how they were introduced. Oh, but we're imagining. Okay, okay, if we're imagining. <laughs> a, a, a different way to introduce them. Yes. Hmm. Okay, maybe like Superman, you know, like their land is destroyed... That's kind of how it happened, isn't it? Their land was destroyed and then they got sent to other places. Well, I will say that Pandaria still exists as a continent. It's just that we chose to explore and leave our homeland to see bigger environments. Okay, so... um. The way that I would think that you would introduce, and, and you're right about the introducing different characters in World of Warcraft, because the pandas got introduced that way by wandering, but um, the other characters that got introduced prior to that, um, let's see, there was the Draenei, and they had them land with the spaceship. <laughs> Their spaceship actually, actually you know, they crashed. <laughs> yeah, they crashed, and, and then the goblins, the goblins were... The goblins were really a lot too, like um, a lot, uh, kind of like the pandarians because the pandas, because the goblins or the in World of Warcraft, they were just these little non-player characters that that were then introduced that were then introduced as real characters, and so that's you, that's kind of how wow, World of Warcraft does it. And the, that's how they do the mystery, right? They keep finding somebody. They keep finding somebody who was who was there already, <laughs> and it was a character that they seem to like. And then they come and they look in. They they try to find the mystery about it. So I think I think Blizzard has a pattern when it comes to to finding a minor character and then and then finding a way to introduce them and and have them be a major character that people can play. Hmm. I got paused to that, but I liked where that was going. Very cool. Okay, thank you. Let's see if I can still screen share with you guys. Alrighty. So back on that one. So we've. This is what it is as of right now. This is an abbreviation of what's going on. So with Pandaria, it started out with a mystery. And actually, sorry, I forgot to, I wanted to, I didn't mean to backtrack this, but the Pandarans are very, very special. They you have to take something that is special and you have to really exploit it because Pandarans are the only race that can choose which side to be on. And this was a huge thing. And for me personally, I think it was it, it was more of a modern gaming trend that affected this because with um with sandbox genres such as Minecraft and and sandboxes like sand with Second Life you have that chance to create and you have to really affect the world that you're playing in and to really being able to choose which side you're on is a huge deal it it leads us to more exciting avenues to go down so as you'll see with this quick little 
Exod, I mean, this is only up to where we found the Oath Spirit, but I mean, they're just a whole bunch. This is showing all the all the nooks and crannies that you do when you're doing your mystery. So, I mean, it all started out with the mystery is something is wrong with your home. You must investigate. That's what happened. So, I mean, oh, you get to leave your soul side and you get to go find what's happening. You go ask people, you go talk, but, I mean, you soon find out that you had to go find the spirits to help you. So you've already had to fight the fire spirit, and he's like, okay, you passed my test. I'll go with you to figure out what's going on. Well, I need my my other spirit companions to help me as well. So we go find the water spirit. We can't find the water spirit except for an old man who is from. And and it is interesting, Blue. It is interesting how what you're really what you're really talking about could could be considered a quest. I mean, I I, I know we've had you present on Joseph Campbell before, but but this is is starting to sound like Joseph Campbell. <laughs> so um, I I'm I'm wondering how do you compare like quests and mysteries? And and is and and does every quest um, seem to also have it have a mystery in it? So I was so um, I don't know when you might address that, but at some point, if you can address the the quest and the mystery part, that would be great because the more I'm listening to this. The more, the more it sounds like that every, <laughs> it sounds like that every mystery, you know, has a quest to it, or every quest has a bit of a mystery to it. Yes, that's true. I'd say every story is based on a certain type of mystery. Like, let's start with Lord of the Rings. It's even though it's the quest to destroy the ring. I mean, we didn't know whose ring it was in the first place. Whose ring is that? How do we destroy it? What do we have to do to get rid of it? Why is it doing all this bad stuff? Why did this happen? And I mean, the thing about Lord of the Rings is that it didn't start from the beginning. It started in the third century of the age of humans and progress or whatever. So, I mean, there's two centuries of unaccounted history for that. I'm sure J.R.L. Tolkien has written down somewhere. But it's that trying to not mess with what is already in your mystery, what's, your, what's in your story. You don't want to ruin that continuity within your storytelling. So, um, real quick, when I lagged out, how far did I get? You were telling us about the water sprite and about having, having your friends or your helpers come along with you. And that's when okay. I started to ask the question about quests because it started to sound like a quest. Okay, can you ask the question with quest again? <laughs> sure. Sorry. What I, what, I, what I was saying is, is it inherent in every mystery? Do they kind of have a quest? And, and is this starting to sound too much like Joseph Campbell? I love Joseph Campbell because he's amazing. But I hate... It, it really does sound like that. But I mean, here's the difference between storytelling that traditional narrative story structure to what when you break down into the genres of mystery into horror into science fiction is that because they have particular focuses mystery is special because it focuses on the questions and those questions drive everything the quests are just actions that you have to do to progress further they aren't the questions themselves. The questions are an underlying factor because when we're in Pandora, our question is something is wrong with with our home. We have to figure out what it is. What is wrong with our home? So that's the underlying factor, but we have to do this go get gather the fire spirit, now we have to get the water, we have to wake up the old spirit. We have we um we have to help the villagers 
in the old town. We have to get the mallet to wake up the old spirit. Oh, okay, we have the old spirit now. We're now going to find the wind spirit. Oh, on the way to the wind spirit location, we had to fight baboons with red paintbrushes. And then our um, female had to get a uh, uh, astral meeting with the wind spirit so we could find the wind spirit because he was hidden and then once we found the hidden wind spirit we found out that he was afraid and scared of a rampaging serpent that that was upset because Pandero was in danger and because they didn't get along in the first place we had to help them see through the light it's they're just so it depends on how you're connecting them and it's just this whole spider web of of these quests with these tasks that you have to do. Puzzle games or puzzle mysteries are all very similar. When um let's see, I'm trying to think of one that's that's very popular. Um with with puzzle mysteries, you're usually with these types of tasks where you have to you have uh, there was there was a short story that um so Arthur Conan Doyle wrote that was the missing engine missing steam engine and what it was was the grandfather left a box for this boy and he had to find all these pieces for the steam engine and figure out where it went to and so throughout the throughout the this was a short story he would go to his family members and ask and then he went to the junkyard he he was looking for these pieces and i mean that is considered a mystery because it's focusing on the mystery of the steam engine and not just on the collection of those tasks. So, I mean, I, that's what separates quests from those tasks that lead up to your revelation on what the answers are to your mystery. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, 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 does, that does explain it a bit better. <laughs> okay. Because there is a difference. It's just trying to separate it out from what is and what isn't. And lots of flowcharts will help with that a lot. I, there are lots of uh, 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 Sherlock Holmes um, flowcharts out there that were like, this is what he was thinking of at the time. Like People really spend time on these elaborate flowcharts that explain his thought process to processes within the main stories that so Arthur Conan Doyle wrote. And they're they're amazing. I wish I added one in now that I thought about it. But um, sorry, we're moving on with Wow. So the old spirit, he's asleep. We have to wake him up. And I'm sorry, this is probably one of the most hilarious situations for me to have my main character dealing with G. Firepaw, who is the hothead of the group and real stubborn. But he keeps trying to wake up this bull and I keep thinking the bull is probably ignoring him and it, it's because of the way the horde is and their stubbornness it was like I wish they connected better because well I mean I guess that's why G is here because of that stubbornness it was just showing that G's stubbornness wasn't exactly a match for the magical elements of Earth but so we had to wake up Thought Spirit, we had to find the Mallet, go through a long line of stuff for that. We had to go through quite a lot to get to the old, to the wind to the spirit of the wind. And he was afraid of something. There was a dragon outside, I mean a serpent that was upset with Pandero itself. So I mean our main underlying question is of something is wrong with Pandero. We had to figure out what is wrong with Pandera. That in turn is going to cause tremors, little fissures throughout your setting, throughout your location that you're going to start seeing signs of, start seeing it trickle down. It, and it does, it affects them. And throughout your experience on Pandera, you're, there are many earthquakes because the total is holding and he's shaking and letting you guys know. But, well, we finally get on to the air balloon. We all guided with the spirits and they help us talk to the total who tells us what's wrong with Pandera. But sure that answers our question. What is wrong with Pandera? Oh, there's a thorn in my side. Okay, well we'll go f remove it. What? Wait, wait, wait. Who are you guys? So 
new questions start popping up of po- start popping up that we didn't think we had to ask. Who are these people? And how do we help save our home? Because even though they're the ones that caused it, we still have to save our home. We're in we're now in a even though the Pandaros are on this island and in the world of Azeroth now, it's their world. It's their island and it's if they don't get the ship out, it's going to sink the total and everyone's gonna be flooded. It would be disastrous. Like we're at cataclysmic Wow, I hate I hate the fact that I use that. We're at such a tremendous amount of pressure on you, your character that you're playing, but also on the people that you've joined with G and the the blue God, I really wish I could remember her name. The the other guide character that they have a, a interesting romantic relationship that I wish they got together, but because of G's bullheadedness, they never got together, and it kind of does make me sad. But I'll get into that later. But it's because you finally answered your question, you get more questions, and you're trying to seek those answers out. So even after you save the menu, okay, you know who these people are now, and how are we going to fix this land? Okay, we finally got the ship out, and we healed up the patch of wounds. I really am apologizing for the fact that I, I if I spoiled this for anybody, I should have really had, like, spoil alert, spoil alert at the beginning, but... With this particular thing, it was different. Because this isn't like the other sorting areas for the other races. The other races, you're being commanded to go do things, and you're running errands for people, and you're, you're helping people out. But I mean, they really, they really did a lot to evolve what a sorting area was. They really did raise the ball. And so our final task for the sorting area, before we leave the sorting area, is to decide what side we go on. Where do we go? And even though this was a question we weren't thinking about, it's there now. And I mean, we have to come to terms with deciding how we're going to proceed. How are we going to continue? So, so you you did that. You've chosen your side, and you're flying away in your air balloon with your uh, appropriate guide or guidance person, whether it was G or the Alliance panda. There was so much more. I mean, if you breeze through it, okay, but I mean, there was a lot going on. It You went through a lot to get there, but I mean, with the pandas, with the conflict between the fire panda and the, the water panda, the alliance panda and the hold panda, I'll just name them that. You had so many side quests, so many backstories. Backstories is another term that um, within mysteries, where you have characters outside that momentarily but ongoingly affect your character in some way. So you have um, Lee Iron Paul, which was this reoccurring panda that throughout all the areas he was trying to break things with his fists, which he accomplished every time until you got to the last part because there was a realization that there are things that are stronger than him. So even with just him, we had, he was a very like, oh, I'm so strong, I can show off. But then when he came to the, but when he came to something that he couldn't accomplish, that he couldn't do, he recognized that. And he felt indebted to you for showing him that he wasn't as strong as he thought he was and that there's more out there. And I mean, that also aids to the fact of choosing sides for your panda. So, and I really do hate I'm spoiling this, but your master dies. How could they do that to you? That is so, so mean. I'm sorry. I couldn't. I was like, no, no, you did not just die. You walked up this mountain with me. How are you leaving me? And I mean, that's what happened. You get connected to these characters because they have emotion. They have personality. And they, they've helped you along the way. And I do kind of feel bad that the the Waddle Panda and the Fire Panda aren't going to get together because she can't forgive him for his reckless behavior of blowing up the side of the total, even though he truly believed that that was the only way they were going to get the ship out of his side. So, I mean, I wish they had time to talk it over, but they're both so so upset at each other that they don't. 
I hope someone tells me that I'm completely wrong because once I get to level 80, there will be a quest where they get together or something. I don't know, but I've, I really wanted them to succeed. And I mean, it's those things, those side quests, those characters, those challenges, those characters that keep people engaged, that keeps your students, that keeps players, that keeps the readers engaged. They want to continue reading. They want to persist with the story. They want to see out through that mystery. They want to go through that journey. They want to figure out the how and the why and who, what, where, when. All those questions all come together. So, sometimes the simplest questions have the hardest answers. So, what I mean by that is, we had a, a simple task. We were choosing how are we going to seamlessly integrate pandas into WoW folklore without shaking up the world. And that is a, how are we going to bring them in? Sure, we could just drop pandas off with planes and make panda bombs and have multiplying of them. But it's, we created a story, we created a world, a world of them, the mists of Pandaria that kept them hidden for so long from the war that they're the only truly neutral race as of right now, so that they are able to choose which side to go on, because they aren't partial to either the Alliance or the Horde side. It gave you a chance to really express that Sure, the Horde is more violent. Sure, the Alliance is a bunch of rural pricks and whatever. But, I mean, they both have their ways. And, I mean, it, it really comes into play about how humans are and how we all have different ways of doing things. So, really quick back to my other, because we finished that slide. So... Being able to define your question will help define your mystery. So sometimes you may even be starting out with the wrong questions, but it's only until you figure out what is the question that you're trying to define will it help define your mystery. So I have my example with WOW, with the Pandarans, and that, that it was that question of, Something is wrong with Pandera. We have to go do something, but what is it? What is wrong with Pandera? And it leads us down this long journey, and it keeps us asking, how do we keep doing this? How do we keep overcoming the odds? We're the good guys. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. Sure, that's a human quality. And, I mean, Sherry Jones was great last time. She was talking about the human connection and how it gives us a reason for us to impart emotion and feeling. And I mean, that's what desired storytelling is. That is because mystery is still a story. And how you do that, how you have your audience connect with your characters, they have to find something that they have to connect to, whether it's human emotions that they're displaying, whether it's human reactions, whether it's human familiarity with those objects or what they're doing, like, oh, they're riding a horse through the desert. You're familiar with that, but it doesn't exactly give you pathos. It doesn't give you feeling or emotion to connect with. It leaves you more with bathos. Bathos is when you do not feel an emotional connection to someone who died. Let's say a pirate died. A pirate died. You don't really feel anything because he was a pirate. He probably did very bad things. He kidnapped people, he slit people's throats, and he all he cared about was treasure and booze and, and women. Well, come to find that he his he, at his funeral they buried him at sea, they pushed him over, and that was that. Well, a lone boat comes out and someone pulls him out of the water and they gave him a proper burial. And we find that it's this woman who was practically the right, practically the, the caretaker of the pirate. Like, she got things done. She took care of him, and we even come to find out that that was his mom. And it's like, 
Oh. So we had to find out that even though villains do bad things, they all people too. And so, sorry, I totally went off on a tangent just then. But being able to define your question, really finding the right question will help define your mysteries, whether the mysteries you're creating for students, whether you're just creating mysteries for yourself. It's cool to think about your everyday activities in the sense of the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why. And I mean, it really helps you analyze and dissect things that are going on, whether you're just deciding what to eat or, because I mean, questions can lead to mysteries. What are you going to eat for lunch? Who are you going to talk today? What, how are you going to get to work? How are you going to get home? Those become journeys, whether they're very simple or very quick. You don't know what's going to happen along the way. And that's where you introduce little techniques that are the femme fatales, the red herrings, the MacGuffins, and all these things that will add to a, a twist in your endings. So... Please, any questions? I know I talked a lot, and I've probably blown some brains, but please ask any questions that you have, and I'll be happy to answer. Actually, what we had were a lot of comments. Oh, and boy. And the comments were about the difference between it being part of the story and not just reading or watching it. Well, what, what's the, what do you think the difference is for the person experiencing the mystery by playing it rather than just reading about it? Well, as, a, as someone who's just reading about a mystery, you're just going along with what Sherlock Holmes is doing. And, I mean, he's probably, he's a genius, so, I mean, he's going to explain and analyze and dissect everything. But, I mean, that's not what necessarily you do. So, within the game, you have that freedom of choice that allows you to make the decisions, come to your own conclusions, follow your own paths. Within a book, it's all on that page, on that text, within those pages. You can't really change that. So, I mean, that freedom to choose, that freedom to play how you will is what makes a mystery game so more, more interactive and more engaging than just reading about it. And, and then we it did have some questions, some follow-up, I think, on, on Secret Squirrel in Red Panda. Oh, my. And, and, and that's from the group in Second Life. <laughs> um, well, what in particular did you want to know about Secret Squirrel and Red Pandas? <laughs> <laughs> well, Secret Squirrel, the, the comment that you made about Secret Squirrel not originating with James Bond. Oh, no, no, no. Um, Secret Squirrel came before James Bond by okay. a good 20 years, actually. True. Oh, okay, I got you now. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. As did Red Panda. You're right. They were both fitting that secret spy genre with mystery involved, because they were always trying to solve a case. But, I mean, James Bond, I mean, he's pretty much the, the postal person for secret agents and killing people and using guns and violence. But, and getting... Uh, James Bond is a great thing, but it just it just takes from so many things that nobody notices what it took it from. And the, and the next question, or it says comment. <laughs> no. Oh, and uh, we, we were asked, where does Dick Tracy fit into it, timeline-wise? Okay, Dick Tracy is within the um, DR Warren. Sorry, let me go to that real quick. Oh, we're not seeing your screen at the moment. Oh, okay. Oops, use. How about now? Okay, he fits within the W.R. Bonnet area. So, even though mystery is a very strong subject, there are lots of other people I could have talked about. But, I mean, like, I was trying to affect what was the important parts and the parts that really made it acceptable for different age groups. Because Dick Tracy was just another, was another uh, 
not copycat, but I mean, it was just another facet of what noir was. And Dick Tracy was more popular in radio plays than I probably will say about personally for film. I mean, sure, I love a good noir detective film, especially the black and white ones. I love how they use light to contrast. It's, it's incredible. But it fits into that era of the the private eyes, the the not the who done it, so the police procedurals. It was the wow, my brain just died. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, it's after all. It was the the hard boiled. It because it's Dick Tracy, I mean, he was he was a detective sometimes, sometimes he was retired, sometimes he was ex detective or he was he was uh, fired off the force because he did something outrageous. But Dick Tracy was, I mean, he didn't always follow the rules. So, I mean, I don't really think of him as a police procedural. But, I mean, he did know his crime. and He knew police procedural. I mean, he knew what would happen if he did something wrong or if he stepped over the line. And, I mean, he always kept himself pretty clean. And, I mean, sure, Dick Tracy and a lot of... Uh, People were like that. Um, they all had different trench coats. He had a yellow one. There, were, there was a guy with a red trench coat. There was a guy with a, a purple trench coat. I mean, like, it's... I didn't want to go down that route because it, it would have just added more to what I had. It, it didn't really add to what I was saying. And, and the, so the last question is, because we'll be closing up, are mysteries in general easier to write than other genres? Uh, that depends on whether you want it to be successful or not. Because, I mean, sure, you can write, write those cozy mysteries, those Agatha Christie's or the murder she wrote, where, I mean, they're fairly popular because they're character-centric. They focus on character development, and you like the characters, and then the reason why you continue to buy more books in that series is because you like the characters. You're attached. There's a sort of um, attraction, a, a magnetation, as you will. But to make it a good mystery, to make it, you need to balance out what the mystery is. You need to balance out between the side, the the side, the backstories. You need to figure out because mysteries are kind of like that web I was talking about. You have to be able to put layers and layers of webbing so that you can see through it, but not the people who are reading. You have to be able to distinguish between who's solving the mystery, whether it's your audience or the main character, and the person who set up that 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 mystery, the person who committed that crime, that perpetrator. So that, and I mean, you have to mix it up with different elements too, because straight up mystery just doesn't have what it has anymore. So I mean, you're combining it with other things, whether it's with romance, supernatural, spy, even. Or hero, you have to add more quality to it because I mean that's what people are expecting these days. They expect more, and they expect it to be well done. So it depends on the writing as well. Okay, and I'd say with that we, um, I'd say with that we're ending up, and we want to thank you so much for this. And oh, if welcome. you want to come back on screen and wave goodbye to us, that that would be great. Oh sure. <laughs> bye, 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 William. <laughs> bye, Dave. <laughs> well, Take care, guys. Wave. Bye, Smith. <laughs> bye, bye, <laughs> William. <laughs> hey, guys. And then Blue, we have we have you there. And thank you, thank you so much for this. And, oh, you're welcome. Uh, I hope I wasn't rambling too much. <laughs> and we're off. No, you weren't. You're great. <laughs>